Well, this is uh, first, uh, I believe, unless my watch is wrong, we're starting two minutes early. Wow. It gives me two more minutes in the sermon. All right. Well, what a wonderful uh, weather we were having yesterday and today. Uh, sure, it's a real blessing. Uh, kind of makes me take notice more of the wonderful creation that we have, uh, that we're called to be stewards of. In our um, service today, in our prayers, I thought we would include that as well. And as we begin with our opening hymn, Brothers and Sisters in Christ, how many of you know that one? Okay, some of you, you don't know it. I remember the first time I sang it was at a youth gathering. And ironically, there's a youth gathering going on right now in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So uh, the timing's pretty good. Maybe Bill can play it through for us so you get uh, the familiar with the melody. It says verses 1 and 3 in your red songbook. Please rise as we sing together. <clears throat> sing Alleluia, Amen. Let, let your praise and your praises ascend. Lift up your voices and sing to our Lord God, our Savior. King, here brought together by grace, we are gathered as friends in this place, and assembled as one in the name of the Son, lifting hearts, lifting hands, celebrating as friends and proclaiming the Lord all our praises afford we are brothers and sisters in Christ Lord teach us how to proclaim all your goodness your love and your Lord, teach us how to forgive. And in love, teach us, Lord, how to live. Raising our voices in song, help us tell all the world we belong. And assemble as one in the name of the Son, lifting hearts, lifting hands, celebrating as friends, and proclaiming the Lord, all our praises afford, we are brothers and sisters in In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us pause for a moment of silent reflection on God's word and self-examination.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, all divine, dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idol throne, reign supreme and reign alone. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in your deep compassion, you rescue us from whatever may hurt us. Teach us to love you above all things and to love our neighbors as ourselves. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 through 4 continuing with 19 through 13 and 16 through 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. So do not act like people in Egypt where you used to live or like people of Cana where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all regulations and be careful to obey my decrees for I am the Lord your God. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters dropped. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines, and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name your, your God by using it to swear falsely, I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. 
Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your neighbors. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Considers the poor. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him. He is called blessed, and the Lord sustains him in his affair. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love from the great congregation. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. From everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. The epistle reading is from Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Atheris, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives you, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the apostolic word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, 
and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his compassion, his mercy be with us always. And may he bless us with the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to the word that we have before us today. Amen. A lawyer and a preacher both arrive at the pearly gates at the same time. St. Peter greets them, welcomes them. Oh, we're so glad you're here. He says, come on, follow me. We're going to go into paradise, and I'm going to show you where you're going to live. So they get to the first place, and uh, St. Peter says to the lawyer, he said, this is going to be your home for eternity. And he's just excited. He's jumping around, and he's so happy. It's a beautiful place, a mansion with wonderful gardens and pools, and it was just something of, of paradise. Well, now the preacher was thinking to himself, wow, if uh, that's what the lawyer gets, and I've worked hard for God my whole life, oh, I can't wait to see what I get. Yeah, you know where it's going. <laughs> they go a little bit further on, and there's this dilapidated old uh, apartment building, and there's all kinds of cars out front. I didn't know we were going to have cars in paradise. And uh, uh, St. Peter says, now you're going to be in the room on the third floor. Now, the preacher gets very upset. He says, wait a minute. Look, I worked hard for God as, as a preacher all my career and all my life. And how come the lawyer gets uh, this mansion and I get this little room in an apartment building with a bunch of other preachers? And St. Peter says, well, my friend, uh, we have literally millions of you preachers up here, but we don't have hardly any lawyers. <laughs> uh, Dave, that was not a personal... <laughs> But we do have, in the opening of our gospel lesson today, a lawyer, an expert in the law, and he comes to Jesus. Now, he doesn't come to him to inquire about what Jesus is teaching or doing. No, he comes with an agenda. You know, now, I, I've hardly spent any time in a courtroom, and, and I'm pretty happy about that, but... Um, when you watch movies or TV series and you're in a courtroom, and lawyers are pretty skilled at asking questions to lead you in a certain direction. And if you try to give a full, more complete answer, and they, oh, no, 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 stop, just, just answer the question, you know, because they're taking you somewhere. Well, this lawyer had a plan. This expert in the law comes up, and his goal is to test Jesus. Now, I'm sure it's because he's an expert in the law and he considers himself to be quite capable and knowledgeable. Let's test out this uh, strange rabbi named Jesus. And so he addresses him, and it doesn't come through in the English, but, but in the original language, it's not a very uh, respectful kind of address. It's translated as teacher, but anyways, and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's an interesting question. At first, you might say, well, yeah, okay, that's, I've kind of wondered that myself at times. But I would suggest that the lawyer, the expert in the law here, is asking the wrong question. He's assuming somehow he deserves eternal life or paradise, but he wants the assurance, and he even uses the word inherit. What must I do to get into your will to inherit paradise, inherit eternal life. I thought inheritances were up to the owners of the, the estate or the property or whatever it might be, and it's a gift to those that they delegate or those that they name in their will to receive an inheritance. But he's got it all wrong. He's thinking, what must I do to inherit eternal life. So he starts out with the wrong question. So Jesus responds, um, well, you're an expert in the law. What does the law say? What is written in the law and how do you understand it? How do you read it and interpret it? 
Well, the, the lawyer probably was very happy because he knew this like the back of his hand, I'm sure. He says, love the Lord your God. It's a direct quote out of Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Doesn't that almost sound like a setup rather than an opportunity to earn eternal life? But with all of your all and love your neighbors as yourself. You know, he answers very correctly, very theologically, and very scholarly, but not with a whole lot of love or compassion. Well, Jesus says, you've answered correctly. So do this and you will live. Now, I happened, I think the expert in the law might have been taken back a little. He might have been thinking, hmm, uh, do this. Well, he probably had a very high opinion of himself and says, well, most of the time, I'm pretty good. But that one neighbor of mine, you know, I, you know, I just don't get along with him very well. Well, so anyways, he wants to uh, somehow justify himself and qualify uh, what the, the law says and what Jesus is now saying, do it. And so as he wants to justify himself, he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, we've already talked about that a little bit. And certainly we're going to see the neighbor here in a much wider, much more expansive sense than we would if we went to... Uh, Mr. Rogers and, and ask him on his show what he was talking about. The lawyer is somewhat, I think, a little bit convicted. But he asks the question. Now Jesus could have just said, um, who's my neighbor? He could have just said, everybody. Everybody that's in need. But he goes on with one of the most familiar of all the, the parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so Jesus responds, well, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. That was a common road. You didn't want to travel on, or if you had to, it was dangerous because it was a great descent from Jerusalem down to, to Jericho that was below sea level, and Jerusalem, Mount Zion, was way above sea level, and in lots of rocks and places for robbers to hide out and to attack people. And that's what they did in this parable. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away and left him half dead. Kind of a hit and run, I suppose. They left him there and they got away. Now, a priest comes by. Probably this man uh, was leaving Jerusalem to go back home to Jericho. The priest might have been leaving Jerusalem. Maybe it was a festival, who knows. But he happens to come upon the man who's half dead on the road, and what does he do? He, he sees him, and he has no uh, compassion, no mercy on him. And in fact, he walks around to the other side of the road uh, and walks right by, leaves him there uh, half dead and in suffering. Now, a Levite comes along. I suppose we'd say that's kind of like an elder in the church. Both of them, priests and Levites, are descendants of Aaron, the, the uh, clan of Aaron, uh, the 12 tribes. But uh, the Levite sees him too. And he does the exact same thing. He passes by on the other side. Now, in contrast to a priest that you would expect would live out his faith and help this man out. A Levite, an elder, you'd expect. They're good people, they're people of the law, they're faithful, that they would help this man out, but they don't. But now a Samaritan comes by. Now Samaritans were kind of uh, looked down upon, to say the least, by the Jews. They were half-breeds, in a way. When Assyria had overrun the northern kingdom, they polluted the, the population and intermarriage, and so, they were despised, but this Samaritan comes by, and when he sees him, what's the first thing that happens? He takes pity on him. You know, the priest and Levite were doing the rubbernecking thing, you know, like people do when they're on the highway and there's a car accident. You know, they're, they're looking, but um, they don't want to get involved. They don't want to help. The Samaritan, he goes above and beyond takes pity on him. 
He bandages up his wounds. He treats them with oil and wine, cleans them out, and probably soothes them. Uh, he, he puts the man on his own animal, the donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him himself for a while. And the next day he took out two coins, denarii are coins for like a day's wages, gave them to the innkeeper and says, now look after him. And when I return, if there's extra expense, I'll reimburse you. Now that is some kind of act of compassion and mercy. I've seen uh, interpreters try to justify the priest and the Levite a little bit. Well, if they were to go over to the man and he was dead, they'd become unclean and they would not be able to perform their duties. They'd have to go a whole, through a whole uh, ritual of cleansing to become clean again could take up to seven days. So that's why they didn't stop. And, and it may be, that's a possibility. I, I don't think we want to talk down the priest and the Levite too much. Uh, I think because they uh, might have been fearful of their lives. It could have been a setup. Could have been this man was laying out there uh, all beat up and half dead, but the, the robbers were behind some rocks waiting for a good Samaritan to come along and then to rob him and do the same thing. Could have been many reasons. We don't know, it's, it's not part of the parable. I, I do remember one time in California, it was around Halloween time, I was coming home from church to go back, or yeah, go back home from after meeting at church. It was kind of dark outside already. And I'm, I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, kind of off to my right, it looked like a human being was, was, uh, fell right out into the street, and I almost hit him. So I stopped real quick to go back and find out it was a prank. It was like a scarecrow dummy that some people threw out there and then had a good laugh uh, because the passerby was probably scared to death that, oh my goodness, this person's out in the street and going to get killed. You never know on the road, and I'm sure you would have reservations. Um, I have stopped to help someone change a tire, even though I'm not real good at doing that, um, because you feel like they could use the help. But today, it's a little dangerous. Well, it seems that the Samaritan, he didn't really count that cost. He took the risk, he had compassion, and he helped. Well, the question then comes. I find it interesting. Jesus kind of leads the lawyer into a certain conversation track. And he says, all right, uh, you're an expert at the law. Well, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? What could he say? <laughs> what else could he possibly answer except the one that had mercy on him? Notice something? He couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. Yeah, the guy, the one that had mercy on him. Go and do likewise. Guess we could stop there, couldn't we? Well, we had extra two minutes this morning, so let's keep going. Uh, yeah, go and do likewise. And I think we misunderstand this, this word, this parable a little bit. It, it comes off as a very uh, moralistic kind of lesson, and certainly it is that. Should we know our neighbor? Should we care for our neighbor? Should we have compassion and mercy on those who are hurt? Of course, of course we should. But that's not what Jesus is doing. First off, he goes through this parable and he helps that lawyer start to realize you can't keep the law. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind and love your neighbors as yourself. Sometimes we fall way short. Should we strive to do that? Of course we should. But I think Jesus was helping him to see that you know how you inherit eternal life? Through Jesus Christ, through the Messiah that has come, the one you're talking to, uh, lawyer, that's how you inherit eternal life. Because really, Jesus is the good Samaritan. You and I are those who've been robbed, robbed of our righteousness through temptation into sin. We're the ones who've been beaten down by sin in our, our sinful world. We've been attacked by the forces of evil and Satan himself. And we're the ones who are half dead. And Jesus comes along. 
didn't count the cost for himself, the risks involved. He treats us, he heals us. He goes to the cross to pay for our sins and forgives us. He is that perfect neighbor. I think that's really what Jesus is teaching in this parable. Now we come full circle. Because of what Jesus has done, the fruit of that faith is to love God as with all of your all. I, I wish, now not that I'm trying to correct God in his word or add to it. You know, Revelation says, don't you dare add to this word. Uh, there's some pretty bad uh, consequences. But I wish it would have said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and money. Wouldn't that have you know, kind of separated the faithful from the unfaithful a little bit? You know, you start getting into uh, some of those things. Well, maybe I don't love the Lord God with my all. I'm not saying you have to give everything you have. But certainly it, it's a way to, it's a test for us to see how, uh, how much are we in line with God's will. But then as we are, now the fruit of that faith is that we do go out and have compassion and mercy just as our Lord has had for us. I think my two minutes are up. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the teaching method of parables that drive a lesson home so well. And certainly, we thank you, Lord, for being that Samaritan, that, that Messiah and Savior of mercy and compassion, that you have healed us and called us your own and we don't have to ask the question, how do we inherit eternal life? We know we have eternal life through your gracious promise and through your sacrifice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue on as we receive the offering and we join together in the offertory. Lord, we especially thank you 
for your answering prayer, for your gracious will extended to those we lift to you. We pray for all those who continue to mourn, who have particular barriers in their personal and inward healing. We think of those in our community and neighborhoods that are grieving today. Be with them, be present with them, move them to consider attending our new grief support group as well. Lord, especially for those that we share with one another in community of prayer for your recovery, health, for Alexis, for Juliana, for Emily, for Bobby, Colette, Joanne, Alfred, Jack, and Jean. Thank you, Jesus, for your loving care. Gracious Lord, we pray your blessings upon us as we look for a vision for the future and leadership to take this congregation out into the neighborhoods around and be that salt and light, that voice of the gospel to all people. We pray for the preparation and the attendance of the evangelism workshop this month and also the prayer workshop. We ask your blessings upon the council as they meet this week as well. Lord, we are in a culture where it is very difficult and we pray for your strength in this time to ward off temptations and to be those ambassadors of your compassion and mercy in the world and those who remain faithful to your word. We pray, Lord, like the Samaritan, that it doesn't matter of race. We are dealing at a time with so many racial tensions among us. The Samaritan helped, helped out a, a man who probably despised him. Let us not get tired of praying and working together with all people of all races. We pray especially, Lord, for peace, peace in our world, but peace in the Ukraine, for food and for supplies and for the comfort of so many who are refugees in strange lands now having to flee their country. These things we pray together. In the shadow of your healing presence, we boldly confess. We bring all these prayers before you, gracious Father. In the name of him who is risen from the dead and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, forever as our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In your name we pray, for you are our Lord. Amen. Let us join in confessing our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe.
should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all of the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Take and eat, the body of Christ for them. Take and drink the true blood of Christ our Lord shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us rise and join together. Lord, and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. They bear his name. Let us pray together. We rejoice in your presence, Lord. Thank you for teaching us, for granting us opportunity to praise you together as a family of faith, and for giving us of yourself in a sacramental pledge of forgiveness, preparing us to join the heavenly assembly. As we prepare to leave, grant us your protection and the blessing of your continued guidance by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Before we continue our closing uh, service, there's just a few announcements. You've probably read through uh, most of them, but just to keep in mind, uh, Saturday the 16th will be the Evangelism Seminar at 10 a.m. And the following Saturday, the 23rd, will be the Prayer Seminar also at 10, 10 a.m. So if you're not doing nothing, please consider coming to these and being part of this. Um, yes, go ahead, Bill. I just want to point out that there's quite a bit of different material, devotional, um, there's posters for the grief support group that need to be put up in area businesses that will allow us to do that. Uh, there's a variety of resources there. Take, take a minute before you leave and look over that back uh, Northex table. Um, we look forward to uh, a, a busy couple months ahead of us, but uh, we're praying for connections in the community and uh, be, be busy at uh, your own prayers for that to happen according to the will of God. Thanks. Oh, and by the way, uh, adult Bible class is starting Proverbs today. <laughs> okay. And one other thing in your yellow insert, please read over about the, uh, the new collection challenge from Fish of Easter Hour. That's very important. They do uh, great things. If you cannot take it out to them, you can drop it off here in the Narthex by August 10th. 10th. Okay, does anybody else have anything to offer? Okay, if not, we'll continue with our uh, hymn of departure. God be with you till we meet again in the Red Song Book, page 202. And please rise if you're able. 